Hey there folks, this is day 7 for COM231. Today we're going to be watching a documentary that I think is really, really powerful and, and does a really nice job of uh, expanding on some of the dangers of the misuse of rhetorical approaches. Um, but before we dive into the documentary, I'm just going to set up a couple of concepts. Uh, if you watched yesterday's lecture, you, you probably remember me bringing up a guy Kenneth Burke. I initially planned on talking about that in yesterday's lecture, but I, I figured thematically and as far as scheduling, it would just make more sense for me to bring up Burke and his relevant concepts today as we prepare to uh, view the documentary Faces of the Enemy. So, and, and the title of today's lecture is Rhetoric Gone Awry, so it's, it's getting at uh, that, that very tension. Only three key concepts you're going to need for today. Remember, our, our midterm is going to be on Wednesday, tomorrow. Uh, so go ahead and make sure that you've downloaded the uh, study guide, which is in the module for today. I'll allude it, uh, or I'll make sure I allude to it in a, a Canvas message just to reiterate the fact that there is a study guide available. But don't be you know, disappointed by the fact that the study guide is really just a collection of all of the keywords that I've uh, highlighted in the presentations, plus a couple of quotations that I think are important to know who said, and then, uh, or who said them, and then a couple of uh, themes and, you know, key concepts. Uh, so it, it's really bare bones, but also that is because most of the material has been reiterated again and again and again. So uh, today, you're going to uh, make sure that you have a concept in your notebook for each of these. Terministic screens, Burke's notion of the scapegoat, and dramatism. Other than Aristotle, Kenneth Burke is by far the most widely recognized uh, rhetorician for people who engage in communication studies for rhetorical scholarship. Uh, he's got a big old bust there at Penn State University. They have a... Uh, very long-standing rhetoric program in their Department of Communication. Um, and he was an autodidact, so he was completely self-taught, and he was writing around the time of uh, World War II. So uh, he very much is interested in, you know, specifically people like Adolf Hitler or, you know, any of the other fascist rulers and how it was that they were able to, through symbols, right, through speeches, through images, through, you know, narratives in front of a podium in an audience, how it was that they were able to rouse people to engage in unfathomable violence. Uh, so, so that's really a big part of Burke's project was uh, how can we look at the art of persuasion rhetoric in a modern context and what is it that's happening with symbols that can move people to do such, such you know, heinous acts of, of aggression towards other people who, you know, they should harbor no ill towards. Um, so th there's a nice little video on a thinker who has a similar concept to Kenneth Burke. He's, he's by far more famous. Irving Goffman was a sociologist who has a concept of everyday life as a kind of dramatic performance. Uh, he has a famous book which is it's fantastic if, if you ever find time or interest. It's called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Um, and so he does a lot of ground field work, and he's looking at different communities and how people go about navigating uh, their performance of their identity, right? So the way you are in front of your parents is going to be a different kind of performance than the way you are in front of your friends. And actually, you become conscious of the extent to which it's a performance when, say, a group of friends that you're very used to, you know, behaving a certain way appears in front of a more formal context, like, say, uh, you know, your parents' dinner party. They come crashing in. You have to navigate these different performances, and you become conscious a, a, a bit more easily in that context of the fact that it is very much something that you're you're curating in that moment, that you are sort of in embodying a certain role. Uh, the only difference is that for Irving Goffman, he calls this dramaturgy. That's the second word down here. For Irving Goffman, dramaturgy is a metaphor. So he says, this is just a useful metaphor. Remember the, uh, <clears throat> the famous Shakespeare quote, which you'll see in the video, uh, all the world's a stage and 
the people only players, right? Uh, for Goffman, that's a metaphor, whereas for Kenneth Burke, this is really what it is to be a person. He takes this very literally, that people are, you know, from the time that you're born to the time that you die, you're engaging in these kinds of dramatic acts. And insofar as, you know, a person exists in society, right, we can't, if you put a baby out in the forest, it's... They're not going to last very long. We need other people in order to survive. And in so far as we exist with other people in a social context, we are engaging in social dramas, social dramas of identity as far as, you know, our community, or it could be something larger like our state, our nation, our, our political affiliation, anything like that. Um, so this notion of dramatism is, is really crucial for modern rhetorical scholarship. One of the tools that Kenneth Burke utilizes is what he calls the pentad. And after he popularized this this shape here, the pentad, he he sort of belatedly was like, shoot, I really should have added this one here. So instead of making a new shape, he just added attitude as a kind of tack onto agent. But <clears throat> if you remember the, the notion of kairos, right, from Isocrates, where we're looking at the opportune moment to seize, this is a tool to kind of engage in an analysis of what we'll later call the rhetorical situation, right? So these are the different factors that we can pull out, the different elements that are at play in any, any instant of, instance of persuasion. So there'll be an agent, some form of agency, an act, the scene, and then a purpose. And of course, like I mentioned, the agent's attitude is an essential part that, that doesn't quite fit into the diagram, but that's very important. And again, to reiterate, for Burke, this is a literal way of thinking about what it means to be a human in the world. So think, uh, here's the little uh, collection of ideas down here. Think a combination of existentialist philosophy, right? If you're familiar at all with people like Albert Camus or Jean-Paul Sartre, they're all about, you know, you're born into the world and you make your identity. So think that kind of flavor of philosophy plus theater plus communication. So, so that's sort of the intersection that, that Burke's work uh, occupies. So this is just a more detailed breakdown of what each of those elements of the pentad are, of, of the uh, dramatistic perspective. So act, scene, agent, agency, and purpose. Attitude isn't listed on there, but that's, that's another good one to note. So the key element here that Burke is trying to, to unpack is what is it that motivates a, an agent when they're trying to engage in persuasive uh, appeals to an audience, uh, especially when there's some sort of change that they're trying to elicit in, in norms that people hold in a society. Uh, I think there's a really nice way that Burke brings up what the rhetorician does versus what the rhetorical critic does, where he says uh, that the rhetorician tries to not necessarily create, but prey upon certain kinds of ambiguities, uh, whereas the rhetorical critic is more interested in identifying those sources of ambiguity and unpacking them. Remember the notion of the enthymeme, which is sort of the backbone of rhetoric. If the enthymeme builds on common assumptions, it's, it's those ambiguities, right? It's those moments where it didn't necessarily have to be the case that, you know, their assumption is true. We could actually unpack that a little bit in a, in a kind of dialectical back and forth. So that's what the rhetorical critic is more interested in. This is an, another really important concept. As you can probably tell, it's highlighted, so you need to make sure you have it down somewhere. One of the other cons conceptual tools that Burke provides to rhetorical critics is this notion of terministic screens. So if you remember in our crash course from Aristotle to modern rhetorical theory, one thing that happened in what we could call postmodern theory is a turn towards reevaluating the significance of language in... Uh, how we study the, the humanities, how we study what it means to be a person who engages in the world. So this notion of terministic screens really embodies that, that transition that's taken place. So this is Burke's phrase for a screen or lens composed of terms through which humans perceive the world 
and the direct attention away from some interpretations and towards others. So we're going to go through a couple examples here if that's still sort of unclear. Um, and here's just another iteration of what you could see as a metaphor, right? So if you look through things in a blue lens, it's going to change the way, it's going to color the way you see things, right? Um, right let's just get to the examples. Uh, so, freedom fighter, someone who engages in an act of, of aggression among other people. If you hold a newspaper up, you're going to look at them differently, or at least they're presented differently, if they're called a freedom fighter than if they're called a terrorist, right? Uh, if someone is arguing for a pro-choice side in, in uh, the political debate in America, they might use a term like fetus to describe uh, human development, whereas someone who identifies with a pro-life uh, position in the argument might instead use the term baby. Again, terministic screens is trying to get at the notion that language, different uses of different terms, bake into themselves assumptions about what is the case, you know, what is this thing that we're referring to. In, in our later chapter on argumentation, we're going to talk about things uh, called stasis, uh, and we'll break down different things like stasis of definition. So what is it that we're calling this thing? Is it uh, an instance of a terrorist attack, or is it an instance of someone being a, a liberator of some sort, doing something that's justified violence? Other things would be uh, military lingo like collateral damage or murder, right? So one is implying that there's a kind of justified nature in the violence that uh, killed other people, and another one is saying it was entirely unjustified, it, it's murderous action. In, in a different context, someone could use the term beef to talk about animal protein or cow flesh if it's a more critical attempt. So all of these hopefully are giving you different uh, examples so that you can understand that notion of terministic screens, right? Uh, it doesn't always have to be a back and forth, like left and right type distinction. Uh, and actually, <clears throat> hopefully some of those examples made that clear. Um, but to think of just like a network or a web of words that sort of color the way that you're going to experience reality. Uh, and this is a really nice quote from Burke that I think gets at that notion. He says, even if any given terminology is a reflection of reality, so in other words, even if it's getting at something that truly is there in reality, by its very nature as a terminology, it must be a selection of reality. To this extent, it must function as a deflection of reality. That sounds super opaque. So what does he mean here? So even if we use the most scientific language, right, even if our terminology is a reflection of reality, terms are selective, right? We can't, we can't speak the entirety of reality as it is. We can only speak about a certain thing. We can only speak about a certain protein, or we can only speak about a certain psychological mechanism. And when we do that, we're, we're, we're selecting, we're focusing in on something. And the act of selection is simultaneously, he's drawing our attention to, an act of deflection, which means we're paying attention to some things in choosing terms, and that implicitly means we're not paying attention to other things. Now, sometimes that's necessary, right? Sometimes we just have to, in order to speak, you just have to say, you know, I'm hungry. And it would... It would be unnecessary to think through all the different possible ways you could phrase that. Uh, but in other political instances, it's actually really important to take note of what it is that's being deflected. What is it that our attention's being drawn to, and what things are we not drawing our attention to in the way that we're framing things terminologically? Another important element of this is the notion of symbolic action. So for Burke, and actually for a lot of other philosophers in, in the time that Burke is writing. Uh, one of the most famous people that come to mind is J.L. Austin, who's a philosopher who's, I, I think he's also a linguist, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, but it's the notion that language is a form of action. The phrasing that you'll see often and that our textbook uses for the first chapter is symbolic action. In other words, language in the sphere of human ex existence can do stuff. Language can have concrete effects. So consider, for example, uh, 
the notion of wedding vows, right? When people are at the altar and they say, I do. They're, they're literally just saying words, but in the eyes of the state, as soon as they both say, I do, something has happened. Something concrete has happened. Uh, you know, they would have to go to a lawyer in order to say, you know, no, this was never actually a marriage. Or think when you make a promise. If you say, I promise I'll meet you there at, you know, 11 a.m. tomorrow. Your friend is probably going to show up to that place. Language has impacts. It has concrete effects. Um, you could even think of a, of a, a non-verbal one. So something like a signature. If you sign something, it's just a, you know, a squiggle of, so uh, of symbols. But in the eyes of, you know, the court, you're, you're liable to whatever it is that you provided your signature for. Um, so all of this is, again, getting at a, a re-evaluation of the importance and the agency that language has in, in human society. So if, if Kenneth Burke is saying that drama is a part of human sociality, if, if to be a person in society means that we're engaged in these social dramas, what does that imply? It implies conflict, right? We've all taken an, an English class where we see the plot arc, right? Rising action, falling action. Rising action implies there's a kind of conflict. That sort of is related to the notion of agon that we had with Protagoras, but Burke isn't necessarily going to be the kind of sophistic uh, philosopher to say that there are two sides to any debate. It's more so that there there is antagonism built into human existence, right? We don't come out perfectly and live forever. No, we come out and we have needs. We have uh, things that we have to do in order to make our uh, lives livable, in order to sustain ourselves, in order to you know try and feel fulfillment. Uh, and that very fact implies that there are things in the way. So, so this notion of conflict is inherently implied by the notion of drama, and that means there's a real there's a real danger. Uh, and we'll get at what's what's the danger that is posed in the in the conflict uh, element in our dramatistic perspective in a second. Uh, so normally the way I, I get at this example, it's a little bit easier when we're in person, but just hypothetically imagine that we're all in the classroom and UW and COVID stuff never happened. Uh, so I would say in, in that classroom context, well, there are different ways that we could select the terms to discuss where we are. We could say that we're in the communication building. We could say that we're behind the quad. We could say we're in UW. We could say we're in Seattle. We could say we're in the US. All of those different terminological selections is going to have implications once we add in the notion of conflict. Uh, because once we add conflict, we add the potential for guilt, right? So consider, for instance, the presence of, of homelessness in the area surrounding the UW campus. It, it's a significant social problem. Uh, but depending on what term we chose for how we're identifying our situation, you know, are we just in the comm building? Is this a communication department issue? Are we just on campus? Is this an issue for just UW? Is this an issue for Seattle? Is this an issue for the U.S., for humanity, whatever? That selection is going to impact how we approach the issue. And additionally, we have an opening for what Burke calls the scapegoat. So it's, it's by far the most negative turn that we can take in this dramatistic route. Um, and he, he says there are two different approaches that you can utilize. And I, I've sort of gotten at some of that here on this slide, so I'm not going to read through that one. Uh, the first one is mortification. That's, that's the positive approach. The second one is scapegoating. So in mortification... Remember, if you're mortified by something, you're, you're sort of like paralyzed, right? You, 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 you fully see something and, and you're, you're temporarily unable to move. Uh, but it's because you've identified something that's traumatic. So for Burke, mortification implies identifying as a part of the problem. Identifying as a part of the problem. So that means that you realize the extent to which you are engaging in the contribution to a certain issue. That also implies, however, the need to transform, to, to change in order to address the issue, because you are a part of that issue. The obverse of that would be scapegoating, 
which is dividing apart from. So instead of being a part of, you're apart from, you're distancing. So you're saying, I'm not a part of that problem. I am not a part of uh, what needs to take responsibility in this instance. That then implies some external force that is to blame. That is when this dangerous element of scapegoating can come in, where you say, no, it's the responsibility of them. It's the responsibility of this other person over there. And of course, there are plenty of different contexts where it is the case that, you know, a certain institution or a certain organization isn't to blame for a certain issue. But these are, these are uh, ways of critically analyzing how, when that's not the case, when really someone is given blame that is unjustly uh, provided to them, th this, this, this system can help explain how it is that that unfolds. So again, we, we mentioned this earlier, but it, after having gone through this whole dramatistic uh, map, now we can reiterate the importance of making the distinction between a rhetorician who's going to exploit amb ambiguity and the rhetorical critic who's going to be more interested in identifying the ambiguities that were utilized to try and engage in persuasive appeals and to open up alternative ways of seeing things. Uh, and this is, this is Kenneth Burke, again, a nice quote, uh, where he sort of reiterates all of this again. He calls this, this whole avenue the gloomy root. So he says, there is a gloomy root of this sort. If action is to be our key term, then drama. For drama is the cumulative form of action. Or cu culminative, sorry. But if drama, then conflict. And if conflict, then victimage. Dramatism is always on the edge of this vexing problem that comes to a culmination in tragedy, the song of the scapegoat. So, Again, this notion always on the edge. There's always this potential in mass societies for our discourse, for, for the existing dominant discourse, to identify a problem and instead of saying, we are responsible for this problem, you know, using the terministic stream to say, actually, yes, this is a, this is a humanist issue and we need to address this, saying, no, no, that's, that's their problem. This selecting a different terminal, terminological uh, uh, approach, a different screen, and deflecting responsibility onto another, which can have really, really, really horrific outcomes. So that's the subject of the documentary that we'll watch today. It's a 50-ish minute uh, documentary from PBS, and as the introduction will show, this was actually filmed and, sh and shown back during the Cold War, so it very much was trying to, to engage in a kind of... Uh, ethical education. It really wanted to say, here's how persuasion is used to make enemies. Let's not blow each other up with nuclear arms. Um, but as it's doing that in that already tense political climate, and you know, we could say that we're again seeing that the importance of that in, in current political contexts, uh, they allude to all sorts of historical events that are, are really great examples of this so-called gloomy route that um, modern developments that mass society and the rhetorical elements that come with that uh, imply. The only caveat that I'll say other than, than what I've already talked about is that uh, the film does have some graphic images and instances of bigotry, racism, and hate speech, so um, I, I just want to give that as a, a precursor before you watch. Uh, of course, the film critically looks at those things, but if you're sensitive to that material, just, just keep that in mind as you as you start the documentary. Uh, that link is no longer active, so don't worry about this. Actually, I was able to get us a, a streamable copy, so I'm going to give us an updated link in the module, and you'll actually just be able to go straight there and uh, click in. The only other thing I'm going to say is that initially today, uh, when this was a, an in-person class, this was one of our second uh, extended responses. There used to be more and they were group things. So I'm actually going to move that. If you saw that on your to-do list, don't worry, we don't have a page essay written today. It's just going to be another discussion post and, and you'll see that once you get to the end of the module. I'll give you a link for that. The, the next extended response, I'm going to save that for one of the later weeks so that we have a little bit of space between those. But uh, otherwise, uh, awesome. Make sure that you're looking over the study guide that the midterm is tomorrow, Wednesday. But again, 
should be super familiar content. Uh, thanks for watching, and I look forward to, as always, reading what you have to say. Stop by office hours on Thursday if you have any outstanding questions, or feel free to reach out with a mes uh, message on Canvas or email. Cool. All right, take care.